Depends on the number of questions, correct? Yeah. And then, um, I have what cards is just two. So, right when you're down to two, do you have to Oh, yeah, that's right, you do have the five. Well, you may. Yeah, you will. Uh, you're 11. Is that going for an hour and a half? Do you know? That's not funny. Not about our two, but you can do it. So we'll just meet. They have the bio. A lot of them. Yeah, I will do that. I guess I'll do it. Oh, come on in. You know what that means. Hopefully. Okay, let's go. All right, we have a busy day ahead of us. A uh, couple very brief announcements. Those who, who wanted to see Dr. Gurley's uh, session this morning, I know it got cut short. We have rescheduled him for uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock up in the uh, paddock room, which is up on the second floor. And that's the session of uh, classifications by antibodies. Uh, you have evaluations that, that were in your bag when you uh, registered, and uh, one of the evaluations is about hotel considerations. We, we look at those very carefully, and we really, really spend a lot of time making sure that the hotel that we select uh, can best accommodate the needs of our members. So your suggestions and comments there are very important to us, and I hope you'll spend the time to turn those in before you leave. You can mail them back to TMA if you need to. We also have an overall set, uh, conference evaluation where you can evaluate all the sessions and it, we also look at those very closely and that does shape the program for the next year. Uh, of course, there are evaluations at the individual sessions the last uh, day and today and, and tomorrow morning. If you want to fill those out, again, they're, they're very helpful to us and I really uh, hope that you will do that. The other announcement I need to make uh, is that a couple people who participated uh, across the hall in the IBM studies, uh, the folks over there need a couple of you to come back just to sign consent forms. And I just want to uh, ask that Charles Unger, James Bates, Ann Eagleston, Boyd Kimball, and Jill Sondker. Uh, I think, Jill, your session this afternoon, they, they want to move it up because they're going to shut down a little bit er earlier. So when we're done here, uh, if you have a chance to get across the hall and take care of that, I know they would, will appreciate it. We are going to have our medical panel get underway in a minute here. Before we do that, uh, as you know, we did the 20 for 20 horse contest yesterday, and we saw the Kentucky Derby from uh, 2003. Today, we're going to see the race from 2008. And again, the top three finishers are the numbers that will be uh, still live going to the final race at lunchtime today. So if AV is ready. Off and running in the Kentucky Derby. Fast start for Cool Cole Man, who takes the lead up the inside, but quickly out of center. There goes Bob Blackjack to take a short lead. Big Brown getting a good position on the extreme outside with the Philly eight bells. A thunder past the twin spires for the first time. Long shot, Bob Blackjack leads it clear by nearly two lengths now. Challenged on the outside by Recapture the Glory with Adriano and Cowboy Cal. And there goes Big Brown, and he's moving steadily with eight bells on the inside and Cool Cole Man. Round in the first turn. The opening quarter was 23 and four fifth seconds on that first turn. Bob Blackjack leads it clear by two links now. And he's stalked on the outside by Cowboy Cow. Just a link back racing in second with Recapture the Glory right there in third. Cool Cold Man settles down fourth. The Philly, eight bells racing fifth. Big Brown, the favorite three and a half links off the pace. Z Fortune between horses. Tail of a county skimming the fence and inching up along the inside. Gallego's got about seven links to make up. A couple links farther back now to Big Truck who's thrown up by Mamba who's stuck down along the inside and moving three wide. Here comes Court Vision with a half mile to run. Opening halftime was 47 seconds flat. 
Bob Blackjack is confronted now from the outside. And here comes Cowboy Cow to tackle him. And Eight Bells is right there with a fighting chance. Recapture the glory. And here comes Big Brown. And he's swooping powerfully five wide on the far side. Tail of the in with a fighting chance. Five lengths off the pace. From the back of the pack, here comes Z Humor gaining ground. Along with Colonel John. He's kicked it in again, but he's seven wide as they turn for home. And Big Brown makes a big move. And he takes the lead. Big Brown is opened up now by three. The game Philly. Eight Bells trying to run him down. In the final for long. It's Big Brown. He's gone clear. Big Brown and kept the solo by four legs. The game Philly second on the inside eight bells. But Big Brown, Big Brown is a superstar. He'll win the Kentucky Derby. Big Brown wins by five. Eight bells ran second. Finishing up third was Dennis of Cork. And then Tail of Akati. The time 201 and four. Okay, there's your excitement for the morning. <laughs> that was to wake you up. Okay. So they, they came in, uh, the numbers 25 and 16, and uh, they're, they're the results right there. Thank you, Nate. Uh, so only one person had uh, picked number 20, and that is Al Alzin Alexander. And uh, only one person picked number 16, and that is Carla Stevenson. And number five uh, came in third yesterday. So those are the numbers that are still live for the uh, final race at lunchtime today. The other thing I did want to mention, uh, we had planned to have uh, seating by disease type uh, for breakfast this morning. Instead, we're going to do that tomorrow morning. I know some of you have asked about that. So you have an opportunity to meet uh, with those who you were with in the Get Acquainted sessions on Thursday. And uh, so we'll be doing that then. I would like to ask uh, the chair of the board, Augie D'Augustinas, to come up. And he will introduce uh, the moderator for our medical panel. We are allowing about an hour, 45 minutes for this. We've asked the panelists to limit their remarks to no more than 10 minutes. And um, we're going to hopefully have enough time to uh, ask a good, good number of questions before we need to leave here, uh, say around 10.45 or so. Thank you, Bob. Good morning. Is everyone enjoying the conference so far? This is This, this has been um, the best conference. This is actually only my fifth conference um, since I've only been diagnosed for six years. Um, but this is by far the best conference, the most well attended, the best presentations. And uh, I just uh, am anxiously looking forward for the rest of today because now we get to uh, hear from the pros from Dover, so to speak. That goes back to MASH, by the way, oh, if any, for any movie buffs in there. I um, wanted to ask a question first before I uh, introduce our, uh, our board. Um, how many of you, in the process of uh, coming up with your diagnosis, experienced running into a doctor that said, hmm, I really don't know that much about myositis? Has there anybody in here that uh, may have had that, uh, that issue? Yeah, I think most of us have. So to, uh, to help you all out, we have gathered together here the top experts in the field of myositis. And if you stop and think about it, without our medical advisory board, which are comprised of uh, top researchers uh, from really around the globe. Without them, Myositis Association would really be just an association of people who share the same illness. However, with our medical advisory board, they take TMA up to an entirely new level. In a level where we can have an impact in the world of myositis. We're making progress, and this marks our 20th year of that progress. So, without me cutting into any more of their time, because we know that doctors love to talk as well, I am going to introduce the, our moderator for this sec segment, um, Dr. David Fiorentino. He's a uh, dermatologist from the uh, Stanford University School of Medicine. <clears throat> so let's give him a warm welcome. Great, 
Thanks so, thanks so much, Augie. Well, I think uh, Big Brown needs the uh, applause, not me. So, so welcome, everybody. Um, I know this is sort of uh, the medical panel part of this meeting is one of the highlights um, for the medical <laughs> advisory board as well as probably hopefully for the patients as well. So um, for the next hour and a half, hopefully you'll get a chance to um, get a sense of what it is all that, that excites us about um, myositis, why, and I think each of us have a different story, and we're probably approaching it for slightly different reasons, but I think the, the basis for all of us is that we want to improve patient care uh, for people who are affected with myositis. And um, so what you'll hear is we'll go through, go down the line with the members of our medical advisory board, and uh, that includes myself, and we can talk for five or so minutes, hopefully no more. I'm supposed to have the cane out and pull, pull you guys off stage if you talk too much, so don't make me do that, please. Uh, and, uh, and you can, um, it'll be sort of a bit of a monologue, so there's probably some time for questions, uh, maybe from me, one or two, if I ask, if I, I'll try to think of a, a, interesting questions to try to ask that may be relevant for you guys. Um, so um, I'll start, and again, I'm, I'm Dave Fiorentino. I, I am the only lonely dermatologist here on the panel. Um, and uh, I actually operate a clinic in conjunction with a, with a rheumatologist, however, um, over at Stanford where we, we um, specialize in seeing patients with mostly, uh, as you can imagine, dermatomyositis because of, of the obvious um, skin involvement with that disease. And so I'm an immunologist by training. I did a, um, doctorate, have a doctorate uh, in immunology before I did my dermatology training. And um, what got me so interested in this disease was partly just that I was amazed how many people were um, misdiagnosed and how commonly um, even dermatomyositis um, went under the radar. And patients would come into clinic with a diagnosis of psoriasis or eczema um, or lupus commonly. And the patients ended up having dermatomyositis. And so I got very interested in that and, and in particular, um, we're very interested in trying to actually, it's amazing, but we're in 2013, but still describe this disease better um, in terms of how patients can look because it's such a different disease. And I'm sure each of you have a different story for how myositis has affected you. Well, even within dermatomyositis, um, that can be so different from patient to patient. And so what we're very interested in is trying to understand ways to classify patients into more groups that look like alike, homogeneous <laughs> groups that um, is very important for the research that we want to do. Without, without being able to group patients, it's very difficult to understand what you're studying. And also for um, clinical trials, for therapeutics, um, you need to have a way to basically have a group of patients that um, you think are fairly similar um, in, if you're going to test a therapeutic. So uh, one of the things I'm very interested in, in at Stanford is not only looking at skin manifestations, because that is obviously one of the organs that's involved in some of the myositis um, diseases, but also um, what the skin can tell us about, um, you know, things that other patients, that patients want to know is, you know, what's my long-term prognosis? Am I likely to go into remission? Uh, do I have a cancer? Uh, what's my likelihood that I, my lungs will be involved? Um, and so those are things we think that the skin can help us, help tell us. Um, and in addition, I do a lot of work on um, actually looking at the autoimmune responses in, in um, dermatomyositis. So these, as you know, many of these diseases have, patients have autoantibodies in their blood. And it turns out that the autoantibodies can be used to classify patients somewhat. Um, and we're interested in trying to find more, understand more about what is the role of these uh, very specific immune responses and can that ultimately lead us to um, a safer therapy for, for myositis. So that's kind of what we're doing right now at, at Stanford is trying to um, really use these antibodies to classify patients and we do clinical trials as well like many of the others here. So that's what we do. I, I guess we can just start at the, the end of the panel. Steve, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask everybody in the, on the board here just to introduce themselves um, and tell us, obviously, where you're from. Um, I think what got you interested in, in myositis and um, in particular and, and, and what sort of, if you have any future goals or dreams, what, you, what, you, what your ultimate dream would be to, uh, in terms of how your life's going to play out to solve this disease. So we'll start, we'll start at the end here with Steve. Steve Greenberg from Harvard Medical School in Boston. 
I became interested in myositis research a number of years out from my training. After I completed my training, I was in practice for six or seven years. And during that time, I saw a lot of patients with myositis and was quite frustrated in the poor understanding of some of these diseases, particularly inclusion body myositis and the limitations of treatments that we had. Um, so I changed directions and went back to a university-based practice and developed a research program around studying all forms of myositis, but became increasingly focused on inclusion body myositis and dermatomyositis for various reasons. Um, and my laboratory over the last 10 years or so has pursued a number of approaches to try and understand these diseases and ultimately to improve the diagnosis of them and to develop therapies for them. Um, some of the things that have I've been pleased to be able to accomplish so far have been better understanding of certain mechanisms in dermatomyositis that are occurring um, and in inclusion body myositis the development of a blood test for diagnosis of inclusion body myositis which is starting just recently to gain experience um, and to have its utility or usefulness defined. I've also been involved in trying to push forth a number of clinical trials. One of them is a clinical trial of inclusion body myositis that I spoke about this morning and I'm speaking again about later on today. Hi, my name is Roop Tandon and I'm from University of Vermont in the northeast of the country. Some people <laughs> ask me where Vermont is. Um, I uh, am a trained internist and uh, a neurologist and neuromuscular physician. I direct a neuromuscular program at the University of Vermont. And I got into uh, neuromuscular disease because my mentor in my fellowship was a gentleman in the name of Dr. Walter Bradley, who provided one of the initial uh, classifications of inflammatory muscle disease. And uh, his mentor was Sir John Walton in England, who was a very famous uh, neurologist who did work and research in inflammatory muscle dis disorders. So I also direct the ALS center and I see a lot of patients with IBM who come to see me who have been misdiagnosed. And, uh, and, and I think that the TMA did a survey a few years ago that showed that up to 15% of patients with IBM may have been told that they have ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So I see a lot of patients with IBM who are referred to me as ALS, and then they get the correct diagnosis on that. I have a substantial clinical uh, population base of patients with uh, not only ALS, but also inflammatory muscle disease. And um, I have been involved in new drug development in ALS, and I hope to be able to take that to patients with uh, muscle disorders as well. Thank you. So, Rup, I was just going to interrupt here. Just curious about the misdiagnosis issue with IBM and ALS. Is is do you feel like that is um, something that is going to be there's in the future in the near future that we can overcome that? And what what are the barriers to actually making a, a more accurate and, and timely diagnosis? Do you think for for inclusion body myositis? Yeah, I think that the, the, the important thing is that we need to educate people about uh, IBM <coughs> and its clinical manifestations. We need to educate people about ALS and how that might present. So education is important. We need to make sure that we not only educate the public, but also general physicians, general practitioners, uh, other folks who see patients with these disorders. And then if they have a problem with the diagnosis, if things don't sort of fit right, then they should hopefully seek a specialist advice with respect to achieving a diagnosis. Good morning, my name is Alan Pestronk. I'm from Washington University in St. Louis and since we're introducing ourselves, ourselves today, the first thing I'll say is go St. Louis Cardinals. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we I, I participate in a, in a, a, a neuromuscular uh, clinic at, at, at WashU in St. Louis where we see uh, patients with all kinds of uh, uh, types of muscle and nerve disease, inclu including many different kinds of um, 
um, myositis. Um, our, our, our research group focuses on two areas. Um, one is, is uh, with Chris Weil and M Matt Harms and, 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 and Tim Miller, the, um, the genetic and, and hereditary possible basis of, of different Im immune and, 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 and hereditary disorders and where the, the, the group that was, again, for the second time, thank you all, um, collecting uh, saliva samples and, and uh, l learning, uh, slowly learning more and more about uh, th that component of the disease. Um, my, my own uh, personal um, interest is, is my thought that um, right now we, we can actually do a lot better in, in, in diagnosing um, these diseases. Uh, one way of doing that, as Dr. Fiorentino mentioned, is by looking at antibodies, but my particular interest is looking at the, um, at the muscle pathology, and it's my thesis that right now muscle pathologists can do much better than, than they're actually doing to make um, accurate diagnoses, and um, my research involves um, looking at muscle biopsies in, in uh, different ways that we can do now that, that it's my theory and evidence that, that we can make better predictions about, um, as muscle pathologists, uh, about what's going to happen to the, to the patient, and as examples of that, um, we can predict by looking through the microscope if you have an immune or inflammatory myopathy, whether you're likely to have a lung disease, maybe one day we can um, uh, predict how likely you are to have um, cancer. Um, we can uh, probably right now predict uh, just, again, by looking at the muscle pathology, whether or not you're likely to respond to immunomodulating agents like um, corticosteroids. And in, so in the process of, of, of analyzing the muscle pathology like that, what, we're, what um, we're trying to do is to slowly propose ways that doctors can look at the muscle biopsy in a little bit more sophisticated ways than most pathology doctors look now and then be more useful in bringing that information um, back to the, the patient's doctors and then to you, to you guys so they can give you better information about what, what, how to take care of you. Um, and so, again, my, it's my hope for the, for the future that with even better ways of combining, uh, examining patients, looking at their blood tests and antibodies, and looking at their muscle biopsy, we can um, take care of patients and one day even uh, uh, treat inclusion body myositis better than we do now. Thank you. Can I ask you a question, Alan? <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Yes. Just, um, so I think that's, Dr. Pastronk is, is very understated. He, he's, you're looking at one of the premier muscle, this man has looked at more muscle tissue than, than, in an intelligent way than, than I'd say anyone on this planet. And he has got a very sensitive eye. And my question is um, regarding getting more out of, it's interesting that this is a technique, right? We've used for years, right? And, and there's still more to be explored. And, and so I'm wondering um, how much of this is an art um, that you need to, you know, really be, have the experience of someone like yourself that, that, that um, it, in some ways can't be taught? And, and ultimately, how much, what are the chances that this could become, the, you know, tests can be developed that are actually quite simple and, the, and, and make an earlier, better, t timely diagnosis just using the right tools? So Again, it's my thesis that this is, um, all of medicine is somewhat of an art, but I think that, that most or, or everything that, that I see through the microscope when we're looking at muscle on Saturday mornings can be taught to other doctors. It's simply a matter of having a, a muscle pathology lab doing the adequate um, number and types of tests on the biopsy when they come in on the in, in to the lab in the first place, and then just looking for what the <coughs> patterns of abnormality are. So um, uh, m my general concept is that muscle is not just hamburger. Um, that if, if you look inside muscle, there's muscle tissue, there's connective tissue that holds the muscle together, and there are vessels, and different forms of, the, of, of inflammatory and immune myopathies um, attack different parts of the muscle. And, and uh, it, I don't think it, it, it's, it's that complicated to look at the muscle and 
see what's affected, and then make these predictions. I just think it's fascinating that probably people think the muscle biopsy should be something that was perfected 50 years ago, but it's, there's still so much in there, so much information in there, if you have a careful eye. So. And, and hopefully skin biopsies in the same way. Right. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Zarif Shah Hank. Uh, I'm from uh, the Ohio State University, uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, to be more specific, there is a question, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought maybe there was a question for you. Uh, uh, to be uh, more specific, uh, currently uh, our um, laboratories are located uh, at the uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital uh, Research Center, which is part of the Ohio State University. Um, I'm tr uh, by training, I'm a neuromuscular disease specialist. Uh, I'm also the uh, director of the uh, clinical and experimental neuromuscular laboratories. Uh, uh, so besides providing diagnostic uh, service and, and, and giving uh, clinical care uh, to the uh, patients, uh, my laboratory is involved in analyzing uh, uh, preclinical uh, material uh, from uh, animals uh, uh, and also uh, involved in uh, the analyzing the uh, muscle tissue from uh, the gene therapy uh, studies that we have been conducting. Um, I work uh, with uh, Jerry Mendel, uh, who has been my mentor in the past, and I'm also the co-investigator for uh, FDA-approved uh, uh, gene therapy, uh, uh, folistatin gene therapy on uh, uh, inclusion by the myositis and uh, Becker muscular dystrophy. <laughs> I can just briefly tell you a little bit. We uh, made some progress uh, finally after going uh, back and forth to FDA. We have injected uh, uh, one uh, muscle, quadriceps muscle on the one side on three IBM uh, individuals uh, and used the low dose because this was a requirement from the FDA. Uh, since we observed no adverse events and there was no safety concerns, uh, FDA gave us the permit to skip the intermediate dose and we are currently recruiting for uh, uh, the uh, high dose bilateral uh, quadriceps uh, injections uh, uh, and uh, hopefully you know, we will be able to tell you about results, uh, our results in, in the next uh, 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 myositis meeting. My laboratory is also involved in understanding the pathobiology of uh, both nerve and muscle uh, disorders, and uh, currently uh, I'm uh, exploring uh, whether or not there is um, an impairment in the regeneration in inclusion by the myositis, and uh, also uh, trying to find uh, ways of uh, improving uh, uh, the uh, regeneration in the muscle, which uh, perhaps will lead to um, uh, future uh, uh, tr uh, treatment uh, options uh, in this disorder. Um, this is an uh, amazing group of people, and um, um, I'm very honored uh, to be part of it. Thank you. Dr. Sank, I was just curious for the folistatin trial. Can maybe some of the um, folks here would be curious regarding that trial. How many more patients would be planned to be enrolled in the high dose? And if that was successful, um, what are the plans for the future for that for that therapy? What we are next? planning uh, to uh, enroll, uh, which is in the process right now. Uh, six patients, uh, they, they, IBM patients, they will receive the high dose to both legs because from the uh, Becker muscular uh, dystrophy uh, intermediate trial, we uh, uh, were very happy to see that uh, uh, there was uh, uh, clearly very encouraging uh, results uh, for efficacy for the intermediate, and uh, we are doing the enrollment for the high dose right now in both disorders. The 
high dose, if that was successful, and then what would the Well, uh, the purpose of this study actually to improve the, um, or to, uh, to improve the ambulation, uh, because this is a direct injection to the quadriceps muscle, and uh, to uh, keep patients ambulatory as long as we could. So this is not a, you know, uh, systemic therapy, although we know that polystatin has, is a circulating uh, protein once it's injected locally into the muscle, and there may be some, uh, you know, wider effects, uh, improvements in the strength. It is regionally, and we have some evidence for that too. We're hoping that, um, you know, that depends on all the, you know, obviously, uh, the resources uh, uh, to see if this could, uh, uh, you know, become a, a larger clinical trial and we can enroll more patients. So. Good morning. <clears throat> I have a very long South Indian name. It's uh, called Kanyaboyna Nagaraju, but people call me Raju. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm an immunologist by training, and uh, uh, after completing PhD, I wanted to work on autoimmune diseases. So, first things that came into my mind is rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. I know, like many of you and a lot of other physicians, I never heard about myositis. So, so I was looking for the labs. I came across uh, Dr. Paul Plot's laboratory at NIH, and uh, he uh, invited me to join and do research on myositis, and, uh, and he, his advice helped me quite a bit, uh, even till to date. So for the last 18 years or so, this is the disease that I think every day and want to learn more what is happening, how the muscle weakness occurs. As I said, I'm a basic scientist interested to create mouse models to replicate this disease so that I can test new drugs, new therapies. So those uh, experiments in 2008 led to the identification of a novel class of drugs, uh, and you all know about prednisone, and uh, it works, but uh, how the side effects are horrible. So almost every organ in the body is affected by this. So by collaborating with a medicinal chemist who worked at Pfizer, so we stumbled on and identified this new class of drugs that we preserve only the beneficial effects and virtually eliminated all the side effects of these drugs. So we did this lot of mouse experiments and uh, toxicity studies, and I'm happy to say that uh, in the February 2014, we will do the safety trials, the phase one human trials with this uh, uh, new class of drugs. I'm hoping that one day uh, we will replace prednisone. Thank you. That sounds pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, my name's Mark Gorley. Uh, I'm an adult rheumatologist. Why do I say adult rheumatologist as opposed to a pediatric rheumatologist? And Dave, you asked us about maybe what some of our goals or dreams might be. Well, I dream of a day, because I work at the National Institutes of Health and I'm a government employee, that one day this great nation will have leaders who can work together and solve problems. <laughs> and not shut the doors and make us not do what we're here to do, and that is to really help you. So that said, I the, was the program director of training at, at the NIAMS, the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Disease Institute, who trains rheumatologists. But like Raju, I had a mentor whose name was Paul Plotz, and Paul Plotz has really done a lot for myositis, and he had an offspring, and his name is Fred Miller, where Fred Miller and I were fellows together, and we have, there's another fellow, her name is Lisa Ryder. So we all work together. And one of my personal interests came one day when, there's, I think that they might be here, is a, a person came and had what's called inclusion body myositis, something you know about. Well, it turned out there was a large family, so we started looking at the genes of this family, and through this meeting we've identified several other families, and we're interested in the study and the genes of, of those people. Also working with Fred Miller and Lisa Ryder, who work with the Environmental Autoimmunity Group, 
We're interested in studying patients to look at how the environment interacts with your illness. So there are a couple of studies you should know. One is if you have the illness and your brother or sister who does not have the illness within four years of age and within four years of disease onset, we'd like to talk to you because we have a billion questions we want to ask you <laughs> to try to find the answers to the environment and what might have gone on. Also, some of you have this weird disease called synthetase syndrome. And there's a new protocol who wants to find patients within two years of onset to ask you two billion questions about what might be going on, what in the interaction is going on uh, in the environment to cause your illness. Lastly, you should all know what the National Institutes of Health is. It's a large funding agency for a lot of research, but also it's your nation's hospital. And we can provide second consultations there, third, fourth, whatever. And people come and they contact me and we make an arrangement so that you come to the NIH and we put you through all the roles and rigors of being seen to try to come up with an answer for undiagnosed diseases or difficult diseases. And that's all at no charge thanks to the taxpayers' money. So that's what the NIH does and, and I'm very happy to be here with you today. And uh, I guess as an aside, sometimes I can serve as a first responder. <laughs> So Mark, that, that was great. I, just questions, I mean, the question about environment and disease comes up quite a bit in, in our clinic, I'm sure, as well as yours and everyone here on this panel. Can you just tell us a little bit about, I mean, are there any things that, that have been shown that, that we really feel are environmental factors that are, have really been shown to be involved in myositis and what can the patient do about that if, if, if knowing these things? Well, we want to live in a protected, sterile environment, not exposed to anything. <laughs> But no, that is said, studying the environment and disease is a very, very difficult thing because there's so many interactions. And when you say, why do you get this disease? We all say, well, it's because part of your genes and the environment and something happened. Maybe you got a virus and then you got sick. But the environment, there are a few things that we know that are associated with the diseases. And some of them are medicines. Some of them are chemicals. Some might be the sun. And those all you know, have an impact on potentially triggering or aggravating or driving the disease process. And, you know, what can we do about that? Well, trust me, with a sunscreen, that's a good thing to do. And I think all dermatologists harp on that quite a bit. Um, and really, I think, you know, you use common sense when you're working around chemicals and other things that, you know, we think might be toxic and to treat them in the way that they probably should be. But I think, you know, that's a big area of research and it's going to be a very difficult uh, answer to find, and it's going to be a, a gazillion different things that are out there. Yeah, do you think someday, we, if we know enough about the triggers, we can avoid these diseases by just avoiding the triggers? That, that's a great question, and, and, and maybe yes in some, and maybe no with others. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm Lisa Christopher Stein. I am the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Myositis Center, and uh, I see a lot of familiar faces. I really like coming here every year to see all of you. Uh, first, I, I was thinking that Paul Plotz's ears must be ringing because when we ask or are asked why we do what we do, I think it's sort of, for me, uh, a series of chance opportunities. And so the way that I became interested in myositis is I'm a rheumatologist by training. And I was doing my fellowship at Johns Hopkins, and I was studying lupus, and um, fascinating disease, and a cousin, really, to, to many of these diseases, in my opinion. And in walked one particular patient, who I see in the room, uh, who uh, really changed the way I started thinking about myositis. She actually had lung disease as one of the major portions of her, major parts of her presentation of her illness, and I had to educate myself. And uh, so through this rare diagnosis, which now has become commonplace in my world of the antisynthetase syndrome, my interest was piqued. And then I was um, sent to work with Dr. Paul Plotz at the NIH. And he really, uh, as a mentor, showed me all that we know and so much that we don't. And so for the last, to do the math, almost 12 years, I have dedicated my life academically and personally to the pursuit of understanding this disease better. What I do, and I'm a clinician by training, but what I love about Johns Hopkins is the translational approach. And what that means is we look in the lab, but then translate back to the patient. And so it's that beauty of seeing science translated to your clinical care. 
The things that I'm interested in now, in addition to clinical trials, include my new interest in looking at the heart, early cardiovascular disease, which is seen in the cousins to your diseases like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. So there's accelerated atherosclerosis in those diseases, and I'm looking carefully in people like you. Um, I'm also interested in the way the heart, uh, as a muscle, may actually be affected more than we've appreciated previously. And I've teamed up with cardiologists at Hopkins to do this. And so our early preliminary work looks like we have, I think, stumbled onto something and hopefully will translate to your clinical care in the future. Um, also very interested, but I don't have the answer yet, to calcinosis. And this has become my personal quest because I don't understand it. I've been, unfortunately, um, I've not been able to treat it the way I like, and I want to make it my personal mission before I retire to figure out um, how we can treat it better and hopefully prevent it. I also want to thank my co-panelists. In addition to all of you, the, the, my patients become my teachers. The co-panelists here have taught me so much. I mean, the likes of some of the giants in the field that are absolutely understated at this, uh, in this panelist. I can actually thank every one of them for teaching me about this disease. And most importantly, I thank you because I learn every single day. I'd also like to make one plug in that our myositis center has grown. I'm privileged to work at a place where we really do dedicate all of our time to looking at muscle disease. We've recently um, been able to hire on two new faculty, and I'm happy to report, I think as of today, I'm not sure how long I can say this, there's no longer a four-month wait, um, so I can actually see patients a little more efficiently, and that may be the greatest improvement that we've made in the last year of trying to make appointments for all of you more efficient. So I look forward to uh, seeing some of you at the conference, and um, I thank all of you for coming to learn more about, about your disease, and I'm, it's a privilege to care for you. Thank you. So that's great, Lisa, it's good to have. Two years ago I was here with Lisa and she could barely speak. Um, she had some kind of awful infection. I, I think there was a golf ball in your throat and it was just, you looked so sick. So it's great to see you feeling better. Um, but Lisa is someone, for those of you um, who, who don't know, who, who's trained in rheumatology, but really is, is always trying to overextend herself to understand other specialties, which is really fa great. I mean, she really became, uh, wants to understand how neurologists look at this disease and, and how dermatologists look at this disease. And, um, you know, I think that's actually really important. It's, it's great to have multiple specialists who see you, but to have, um, I think, the need to have our multiple disciplines understand how the other discipline is looking at this elephant, I think is, is a really important, um, an important concept. And I think Lisa is one of those people who really espouses the fact that we need to get together. And that's why this is so interesting because we have dermatologists, neurologists, rheumatologists here all at this meeting talking about what we see. Um, and I just, you know, I want to thank Lisa. And, and is there anything in, in particular, Lisa, do you feel like for the patients, I mean, we're, you know, that they may be, any advantage that you want to say that of having another specialty look at their disease, um, that they may be, that, that may be giving them, an, you know, yeah. an extra? Yeah, maybe. I, you know, I, so I have an unusual lens in that, and, and I think some of the confusion is that p patients believe when they come to our center, they'll necessarily see all of us, which is not necessarily true. In general, it's a rheumatologist or a neurologist and, if necessary, pulmonology and then all of the uh, other folks like uh, physical therapy, et cetera, that, that see the patient. From my own personal experience, actually, I'll make one comment that the probably the most quoted paper I've written is not in scientific literature, but more of a review, and it's entitled Neurologists are from Mars, Rheumatologists or from Venus. I did borrow the title. I actually went to a meeting recently in Amsterdam and the paper was on the, that's how they started the meeting. I thought, well, I've arrived. Apparently someone's listening. Uh, so I, I think maybe just to say that it, it, it might be beneficial at times. I do think that one informs the other. Um, Dr. Andy Mammon, who's the co-director of our center, has taught me a lot uh, about the way neurologists look at the, the, look at the disease. So while I don't have a great answer for who should necessarily see one subspecialist or the other, I'd invite you to try to have them, if you see more than one, to have them speak to each other, learn from each other, and maybe agree with each other, um, which is difficult in any medical specialty. I'm sure you have figured this out. It's true um, you know, in, in my own discipline. But So I would say that so medical science, for sure, I think is furthered by, um, by the... the, the um, 
the learning across both of, of those specialties. One, one last example I'll give you is recently, at um, as you may be aware, it's because of the cross-discipline uh, nature of, of our Center for Neurology and Rheumatology, we were able to describe a certain subset of patients who develop an autoimmune form of myopathy that is clearly associated, whether or not it's causal, it's a question, associated with statin use. And it was, uh, you know, there's a large backstory that takes more than two minutes to tell you, but the brief uh, background is that really without the back and forth of the way neurologists and rheumatologists are educated and the way we see these diseases, I don't think either of us would have figured it out. So I think together, a coordinated approach, and maybe as the patient, your job is to try to um, have the rheumatologist and neurologist play nicely in the sandbox, and the dermatologist uh, would be would be nice. Uh, and I'm not sure I have great advice for that, but from a scientific standpoint, it certainly benefits you. How do I follow that one? <laughs> wow. Well, my name is Christina Charles Showman. I am from the University of California in Los Angeles. And several years ago, I was referred to young women from a very famous lung transplant uh, physician. Both of these women were being evaluated at UCLA for lung transplants. And when I saw them, it was a very bad day for me. Both of them had clear histories of dermatomyositis, clear skin findings that had been going on for 15 years. And they had been talking to their doctors, and their doctors hadn't been listening. And now they needed new lungs. And that was a turning point for me. I was told at the time when I talked to others in the rheumatology area that no one did myositis at UCLA, and there was no one to work with. I didn't listen to them. Um, I'm very happy to say we now have a growing myositis program at UCLA. We have a research cohort of uh, nearly 150 patients growing. We collect blood, uh, RNA, DNA, muscle when we can. Um, and it has been a very rewarding last several years. I was telling some of my colleagues uh, last night in our discussions I was in the hospital uh, rounding on the service, the rheumatology service, a few weeks ago, and a case was presented to me of a 50-year-old woman, very weak, had been in another hospital for a month or two, challenging case, we didn't know what to do, she's about to be put on a ventilator uh, for respiratory muscle weakness. We didn't have all the data we needed, but I had the experience from you uh, that it became a very easy case. We treated her. Uh, she did not go on the ventilator. And the joy in the face of herself, her son, her father, uh, that's what makes my day. That's what makes me do what I do. And so I thank you for that and for the life that I lead because of being able to treat you. Uh, in terms of research, the last several years, I've kind of transitioned my research in the area of atherosclerosis to how that might be very useful in patients with myositis. As Lisa mentioned, patients with myositis do have an increased risk of atherosclerosis. And we did some work a couple years ago just asking myositis experts, what do you do uh, with regard to treating patients with myositis and protecting their heart and treating them with statins that everybody's afraid of uh, that are going to hurt the muscle? We found out some interesting things, uh, that this can't be ignored, and it's actually most myositis experts don't ignore it. Uh, some things in the lab that we have been doing recently involve the so-called good cholesterol, which is very important in protecting blood vessels, and patients with dermatomyositis in particular have a lot of damage to the blood vessels that may be driving the muscle disease and probably the skin disease. And so we found some very interesting findings that I'm hopeful in the future may lead us to different mechanisms and different therapeutics, again, not prednisone, uh, to treat dermatomyositis. So I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to do what I do. Can I ask a question? So, Before I start sobbing. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so the good cholesterol, which is really, and Christina's really, uh, her, I think what, she, what you're working on is very fascinating, which is how the good cholesterol basically can be a protective 
protective molecule for, for us and for our blood vessels and probably other tissues as well. Can, if, if there really is a, a problem with, with patients in dermatomyositis with their cholesterol, their good cholesterol, is there anything that, we can, that, you could, that you know now enough to say to the patients, well, does that mean we should do about our lifestyle or about our, should we be exercising more, should we be eating better, or, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, I'm just curious how that might, might, your knowledge might impact patients right now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question, and I'm, I'm happy to say that there, there is, you know, there is uh, some data that suggests when we say good cholesterol, we're thinking of the cholesterol, um, but it's actually a very complex protein which has functions um, to protect the blood vessels. But there's some data that has been published suggesting that exercise uh, does improve uh, the function of the good cholesterol. And certainly there's been a lot of uh, work done by Ingrid Ludenberg and others in the myositis field that exercise may be beneficial to the muscles. So. Uh, yes, there is some data that exercise may also benefit the good cholesterol function. Absolutely. Yep. Um, can you correlate this uh, good cholesterol, dermatomyositis, and ridding the body of free radicals? Can you comment on that? Well, oh, that's a great, that's an interesting question. Um, so, oh, so oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I don't know if you need, oh. So the question is relating the good cholesterol, dermatomyositis, and free radicals. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly the definition of free radicals, but to me that implies oxidative stress and something that I study like called ox oxidative phospholipids. And uh, HDL's job, one of them, is to bind these oxidized phospholipids and get rid of them from the body. And the oxidized phospholipids are very damaging to the blood vessels. And so our goal is to better understand how HDL does that so that we can kind of move towards a therapeutic that could make it do it better and bind the oxidized phospholipids better and maybe protect the blood vessels and some of the damage to the muscle. Uh, that doesn't get at what initiated the problem, but it gets at protecting the blood vessels and perhaps protecting further problem. Hi, my name's Brian Feldman. I'm a pediatrician and a rheumatologist, and I work at the Hospital for Sick Children, Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto and Canada. Um, and we started our myositis clinic there in the early 90s. Um, I'm sure this is true all over the world, but certainly in Toronto, our patients and our families are very enthusiastic about research, so we have a large research program and a lot of projects going on um, at all times. And uh, we've got some exciting new projects. Um, we're studying uh, new ways of doing uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, to better diagnose uh, uh, muscle disease in children and to diagnose it earlier and more, in a more sophisticated way. Um, we're looking at the genes that uh, determine how children respond to different types of treatments so that by knowing what their genes are, we can uh, match treatments to them that will work uh, better and have fewer side effects. Along with uh, a group that we started a number of years ago called the CARA group, that's the Childhood Arthritis and Rheumatology Research Alliance. It's about 200 pediatric rheumatologists across North America. We're studying the uh, standard treatments that we use in uh, childhood uh, dermatomyositis to see which ones work best so that uh, the best treatments will be available to children all over North America and hopefully all over the world. And um, uh, most excitingly for us right now is that the Myositis Association has sponsored us to study in children who are doing reasonably well um, uh, but are still weak. We're studying creatine supplementation and using very sophisticated uh, MRI studies and exercise studies to see whether creatine, which is what a lot of athletes take to improve their strength and performance, will um, improve the strength of the muscles of uh, children with dermatomyositis. And uh, thanks to the Myositis Association for that. Um, so we, we are, we're uh, a, a very active uh, program in Toronto, one of the bigger programs, um, and uh, very enthusiastic about the work that's being done. I think we're really making big strides moving forward. Thank you.
Um, hello, um, I'm Sue Maylard. I'm an, actually I'm a physiotherapist from Great Ormond Street Hospital in London, and I specialise in um, children with um, juvenile dermatomyositis. Um, I started um, working with these children about 22 years ago, and initially um, my remit was to not touch the children until the doctors had done their job and the disease was quiet. Unfortunately, I was constantly being handed children who couldn't move, who um, were very stiff and unable to lead a normal life. And I actually didn't feel that that was a sensible way forward for these children. So um, I started with my team looking at a different way of providing physiotherapy and providing physiotherapy right at the very beginning of their disease in order to prevent these loss of range of movement and this disability. And my research project was based around proving that that was safe, which we did do. And we have now completely changed our program for managing these young people. Um, unfortunately, during this phase, um, we met a, a young man very late on in his disease and we were unable to help him live. Um, but his family very kindly donated a large amount of money to help us set up um, a um, biomarker and cohort study specifically for juvenile dermatomyositis in the UK and Ireland. And this um, has now been going for about 10 years. We have about 400 children recruited to this study. Um, and so it's the largest study in Europe related to, to children in, with dermatomyositis. And so part of that study, not only have we looked at um, disease profiles, but we're also looking at myositis-specific antibodies. We've been looking at MRIs and um, how we score MRIs um, in order to help make um, diagnoses. We've been looking at um, skin scores in order to make sure that we're also assessing all of the important components related to skin disease. We've been looking at muscle biopsy scoring systems so that actually, um, again, the diagnosis can be made much more easily for these young people and therefore treatment started. And we're also part of a really big European project called SHARE, which is single hub access for paediatric rheumatology across Europe. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but basically the idea is um, across Europe, the, um, the way that these young people are managed is quite different. So this project is pulling together everybody's experiences and ideas, and we're going to try and make guidelines towards um, ensuring that everybody see, receives the same standard of care and the same input, and that's both with assessment and diagnosis and medical and therapy interventions. And so that work is ongoing. So thank you. Sue, so can I ask you a question about, about um, sorry, just physical therapy, physiotherapy. Okay. Um, this is uh, echoing a question that Dr. Christopher Stein asked, similar to what she asked you yesterday in our scientific symposium. But I'm just curious, I'm sure at least we run into problems with this all the time, that patients who come from areas where there aren't maybe physical therapists who really understand these diseases that well. Are there any resources that patients can access, whether that be on the web, internet, um, that would be... Uh, ways to sort of access somebody or videos or people, you know, um, just wondering about ways who people who don't have access to a physical therapist that they can basically, um, you know, move forward on some of this um, some of this stuff even if they don't have a local physical therapist who's that knowledgeable in the disease. Or what would you recommend is there for those types of patients? I know that's a hard question, but is there any anything that patients can do? Um, um, well, somebody came to me yesterday and actually made the suggestion that I worked with the TMA to provide something on the website that actually enabled people to access some information, maybe for their phys physical um, therapist, but also for themselves, because I, I understand that there's very limited resources. Um, but I think there's just generally very limited resources for online advice throughout the whole world. So that would be a piece of work that could and should be done. In Europe, it's not, there's not a great amount of um, um, advice out there either. We have our, our own website for the um, juvenile dermatomyositis um, cohort study through Great Ormond Street Hospital. But again, there's, we have limited information. It's, um, it's a piece of work that should and could be, could be done. But I guess 
from my perspective, um, the, the important factor is that there's always two components to muscle weakness. Some of it's your disease and some of it's deconditioning because you can't use your body. And so maximizing the de or reducing the deconditioned component will actually have a positive effect on your overall functioning. And I think that's often therapists are very scared about doing anything if they don't understand it. And that for me is certainly in UK, the message I'm forever putting out there is don't be scared, try and maximize everybody's individual potential. Hi. My name's Steve Yetterberg. I'm a rheumatologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. <clears throat> and um, it's been, I've enjoyed, uh, this is the last of my six years on the board. I've got to admit that I've enjoyed all of them being with you. I got into this um, because as a trainee in rheumatology, I happened to end up in a laboratory that was doing virology research. It was a rheumatologist who was a virologist. And my very first project looked at interferon in autoimmune disease, something that was about two, three decades ahead of its time. Um, and then somebody else in the lab was doing some work with the virus that caused muscle <coughs> trouble in mice. And I sort of stumbled into that project. And it seems how a lot of things happen. That there's serendipity in a lot that, that goes on. Fast forward now two plus decades. and. No laboratory, but I'm seeing patients almost all the time and have the joy of seeing a lot of people with myositis. Um, it's been a challenge. Um, I tend to get involved with other people's projects. I help collect blood for people who are interested in studying interferon and other things. Um, the other thing that I do is that I'm the practice chair for our division. And what we try to do is look at ways to expedite and be more efficient in the care of patients. So making sure that as we see patients and are taking care of them, that we're collecting data that can be looked at for studies. And we'll leave it at that. That's an interesting point. Sorry, just about the data. I think that's something that we all struggle with, treating a human disease that may not be that easy to recapitulate in, an, in a model system. Although the animal models have the potential to teach us quite a bit about human disease, and probably including this group of diseases, it's probably they're not 100% going to reflect you know, what's going on in, in the human being. And, and I'm just curious, I mean, I, I think we, a lot of, many of us struggle with this because we know that the key is having samples that are collected from patients that are associated with, you know, pretty reliable and, and fairly detailed information um, from the patient, which can take a long time in the clinic and, you know, to collect that stuff. And I'm just wondering, Steve, from your perspective, um, you know, how do you think that we can move forward on, 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 on having more collaborative networks to do that, to have doctors have the time to collect this information? That's so critical for moving the research forward. Yeah, so there's, there are a few questions there, Dave. One is um, collaborating and having people agree on what are the data sets and the data points that ought to be collected. Um, the other is um, what we've struggled with in the individual practice is how can things be done efficiently so that there's a way for standardized questionnaires to be given to patients to have filled out in advance of the appointment, get that data entered into the record or into a database. And so it's a few different levels of organization. Yeah. I just have patients in our clinics say, God, why is this appointment taking so long? Why is this an hour and a half long scheduled appointment? Why am I waiting so long? And part of the reason why is because we're trying to collect all this information. And, and it does take time. And it makes the clinic uh, a little bit clunky and not so efficient. And so that's part of, part of I think, the price that we all have to pay um, to move this forward. So I would just, so the patients can understand you know, that that's, that's a challenge that we face as well as, as physicians trying to treat you. My name is Dana Asherman. I'm from the University of Miami. Um, I've been there since 2010, and that's after about 12 years at the University of Pittsburgh. But trust me, that's quite enough time with Dr. Otis. <laughs> so I, I, I had to move on. <laughs> and apparently, I'm going to pay for this later on. But in any case, at the University of Miami, I see patients, but I spend a lot of my time uh, in research, and really what I do is divided, I would say, into two parts. Um, 
one thing that I do, um, despite the caveats that Dr. Fiorentino just raised, I spend a lot of time um, working on basic animal models of myositis. And it's true, um, you'll be happy to know it's very difficult to, to, well, maybe not happy to know this, but people are different than mice. So it is difficult to extrapolate um, from what we learn in the laboratory. But it's still a necessary step, I think, that we certainly need to understand more about these diseases. and the. The point really for me as a physician is ultimately so that we can find new treatments. And uh, we have to start somewhere, and these are rare diseases, and so that's the, the necessity. Um, it's sort of a double-edged sword, but that's the necessity of developing animal models. The other thing uh, or area that I focus on is, um, which was raised by Dr. Stein earlier, is, is more translational work, and by that I mean we are looking for better um, biomarkers uh, in the blood so that we um, can identify certain problems in patients with myositis, in particular lung disease. It's a strong interest of mine, and so we're trying to find better ways of not only earlier identification of people who might develop these complications, but um, a better way of following the disease activity um, than just doing CAT scans every six months. And this actually dovetails with um, one of my clinical interests um, at the University of Miami, um, again, paralleling some of the things that are being done in Hopkins. We have a combined uh, autoimmune interstitial lung disease clinic that I co-direct with one of our pulmonologists. So um, we are, are certainly investing a lot of effort in understanding this better and, and treating this better because there are no um, real um, sort of gold standard treatments for this complication. And I, I think I'll end up by saying that, that um, this interest of mine in lung disease and other aspects of myositis really reflects why I'm so interested in, in this condition because we always teach our fellows and our residents and the students that this is not just a disease of muscle, it's a systemic disease. But what I think that means for you is that when we as rheumatologists see you as a patient, we're not looking at your muscle or just your lungs, but we're really trying to look at you as the whole person. Um, and we have to consider so much when um, we're dealing um, with, with this disease. As you know, I don't have to tell you that. Um, and no two people are alike. So I, I think that's important for us as physicians to always keep in mind. I love that comment about Chet. Sorry, Dan, but I think you couldn't be more accurate there. Um, no, Dan, just a question. I mean, since we have some time, I mean, just, I know to put you on the spot, but just, I, I, would you be interested in just talking, just miss spending a minute or two about the actual animal model that you have for myositis? And, because it's pretty incredible that we don't have very many of them, and, um, you know, that people might be interested in hearing how, how you sort of have created myositis in a mouse. All right, so I'm gonna try and do this in 60 seconds right. or less. Um, I don't know if the microphone. So th there, there are certainly a number of animal models of myositis, but the real question is how many of those adequately um, mimic what goes on in a human being with this disease. And to cut to the chase, we, as many of you know, we're very interested in autoantibodies. And what do autoantibodies do? They recognize certain proteins in the body. Um, and one of those the, is JO1, or, or we call it HRS. And so we've used that um, as a basis for trying to induce myositis in mice by immunizing them with this protein and, and essentially triggering an immune response against this protein and then looking to see what aspects of the disease are reproduced. And this is important because although we have a very strong suspicion that proteins like JO1 are involved in the disease process, we have very little direct proof of that. Um, and so what we've been able to do um, in one of our models, that interestingly, they get more lung disease than, than humans and that, I mean, than, than, my, than muscle disease. And that's something we actually see in humans in, in certain cases of the antisynthetase syndrome. Um, 
And the other model uh, is really focused more specifically on muscle. When we introduce this protein into muscle, it actually triggers a very exuberant immune response that um, produces uh, relatively florid myositis. Slander. All right, so good morning. Uh, my name is Chet Otis. I'm from the University of Pittsburgh. I've been there quite some time. So I just briefly to say how I got interested in this disease is uh, I was sitting with the division chief, gosh, almost 30 years ago, 84, 85. And I uh, said, well, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, you know, I'm interested in academic medicine. I t take care of patients. And, uh, you know, I have an interest in, uh, in, in lupus, and, you know, I think that's an interesting disease. He goes, what about myositis? I, yeah, I was just going to say, myositis is really what I, what I want to do. So, that's, <laughs> so Tom Metzger, who's a foremost scleroderma expert, uh, was, the, was the guy that was uh, sitting across the desk from me when that happened. So that's how I got interested in it. Very honest way of uh, kind of going into a meeting, not knowing what this division chief wanted me to do, but... Uh, him kind of telling me what I was going to do. <laughs> and uh, the second thing is that uh, uh, just about the IBM history, um, you know, it's a frustrating disease, and I, I look out into the audience, which has swelled over the last, I don't know, 20 years that we've been doing these meetings, and uh, I've done been to a lot of them, and it's a privilege to, to uh, sit and talk to you people. but. I remember going into a room, uh, I don't know, it might have been 10 or 15, might have been 15 years ago, and I couldn't find the chart. It's when we went to hospitals and they had charts instead of electronic records, and I couldn't find, I was with a fellow, couldn't find the chart. And uh, I said, you know, we, we got this consult, elevated CPK muscle weakness. So I knew, I don't know, I know a little bit about that, so we'll just go into the room. We'll start talking to the patient. We walked into this room and this patient was crying and all surrounded by the bed, she had several different family members. Her husband was there. She was 70-some years old. And, you know, and I walk in, I said, boy, this is, this is awkward. Everybody's crying. And, and I kind of introduced myself with a fellow and said, you know, we're here to, to see you. Uh, be, and, and I'm sorry, but, you know, what happened? And they said, well, they just, you know, the doctor just came in and, and, and told my wife that she has uh, ALS and that, you know, we have to get our things in order. I said, oh, I'm really sorry, and I, I just felt very bad. The fellow was there, didn't know, you know, whether to, as we say in Pittsburgh, whether to cry or wind his watch. But uh, we start, I start talking to her, and, and within one minute, I knew that she didn't have ALS. I knew that she had inclusion body myositis, and it was very interesting that to to to, to really, and it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I'm not, it wasn't a difficult diagnosis to make, and. And we kind of said, you know, maybe we ought to rethink this, and we're gonna, t we'll come back in a day or so, and we'll, you know, we'll have somebody else talk to you. And you know, the bottom line is that, you know, this patient in in that very short time period uh, had been given a devastating uh, illness, a diagnosis, and didn't have that, didn't have ALS, and she went on to, she lived. Uh, I mean, the last time I saw her, she was doing fairly well. She was 81 uh, at that point. Obviously, you don't you don't often live nine years with uh, with ALS. So it's, it's a good example of how things can be misdiagnosed or delayed in diagnosis. Third thing that I'd like to say is that um, I was at a conference also back in the early 1990s, and I had um, a call uh, on a, uh, you know, or a message for, at the conference that a patient of mine was quite ill. And, and then it was shortly thereafter that another patient became ill and died, and, and a, th a third patient that showed up in the emergency department that had a so-called heart attack with an elevated CK, and they said that she had basically heart failure from her heart attack. The bottom line is that these are three patients with the Joe one autoantibody that I was taking care of uh, for a, a short time period that all died uh, rather precipitously and dramatically with lung disease uh, because of the Joe one autoantibody. And, and we wrote up that, uh, that article 20 plus years ago on what's called adult respiratory distress syndrome related to this antibody where you can get a devastating response and die rather quickly. And I can tell you that over the past 20 years, I've 
Mo a lot of my time is in dealing with lung disease, and we have a weekly conference with our pulmonologists dealing with interstitial lung disease and its effect on patients with, uh, uh, with myositis and, and other connective tissue diseases. So it's, it's the, you know, and, and I've been involved in clinical trials, and I don't have to sit here and I don't want to tell you all the things we've done and all the collaborations with people uh, in the, uh, on these, uh, at, sitting at this table right now, but uh, when you see something for this long a period and you sit in conferences like this and you stand up in front of smaller rooms with people asking very uh, pointed and difficult questions, uh, it, it does become a passion. It becomes something that's a part of you. And uh, having dealt with this over the years and seeing the lung complications and all the other things that occur, getting emails from physicians and from all over the country and world that struggle with people, particularly those that have acute illnesses leading to lung involvement, it really does become uh, a passion. And all, all I can say is that there's a lot of people up here that, that are sitting here that have a lot of different things on their plate, a lot of different family responsibilities and you know trying to get research funding and trying to take care of patients and teaching doctors and 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 when you get to the point where you have a a passion for a disease you really have that as the major thing on your plate and it and it takes away from a lot of, a lot of other things that uh, that we need to do but it really becomes something that we're totally and wholly dedicated to so you know, I, I appreciate the opportunity always to talk to, to, to uh, groups of patients like this, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, again, sit and talk to colleagues who have uh, dedicated their lives to this. Chad, I was, before we finish, because I think Yuri's last, right? You're in the end. Oh, we got two more with Andy. Um, just. Just a question about um, lung disease, because you're someone who I think of who really has quite a lot of experience with seeing these patients and, and understanding how the lung can get involved, how to treat this disease. And we've known about the Joe one antibody for you know, many, many years now. And I'm just curious from your perspective, sort of what have we learned about lung disease? I mean, just in broad strokes, what have we learned? What have you learned about lung disease? And what do you think in myositis? And what do you think are the next, what are the barriers for the next things we have to, we have to overcome? To treat this more effectively. Yeah, that's a great question, uh, David. I think I think one thing that I've that is very important and really has become a part of the lectures that I give whenever you know we have the opportunity to teach other rheumatologists, for example. I really let them know the importance of autoimmune interstitial lung disease and how it can be missed. And I, I think so. The, the 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 biggest thing that I've learned, Dave, is is that it's out there and it's missed. And we really have to educate the lung specialist, the rheumatologist, the emergency room doctors, and the internists that whenever a patient shows up and they have lung disease or they have what I call double pneumonia, in my estimation, when you have double pneumonia and you got something affecting both your lungs and they throw antibiotics at you, I, you know, the, the, the broad state, uh, statement I would make is that's autoimmune interstitial lung disease until proven otherwise. And you can miss it. You know, I mean, maybe, maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe it'll be double pneumonia or influenza or whatever it is. But whenever a doctor sees a patient where they have lung involvement, they ought to look, and, and, it's, and it's a little atypical, they ought to look very carefully at the skin, at the nail folds. Do they have other symptoms like color changes in their fingers, mild arthritis? Because these patients show up with this particular complication and it gets missed. And Dana and I have talked over the years uh, on, on, for example, diagnosing that particular complication in subsets of patients that are diagnosed as pulmonary fibrosis of unknown cause called IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So that's what I would say, Dave, in terms of the detection and the treatment. I'll tell you what, the only way that we're going to get better at treatment is to really develop the longitudinal registries and have the appropriate translational uh, collaborations between the basic scientists and those that are involved in the treatment of this particular disease and trying different drugs that seem to make sense in that, with that complication. So good morning. Uh, my name is Jerzy Wensowski, and I'm a rheumatologist. Uh, I work in the Institute of Rheumatology in Prague, Czech Republic. And <clears throat> we, this is the institution that is affiliated with uh, Charles University in Prague. And uh, we, this institute 
functions kind of a national institute for rheumatic diseases. This means that uh, from the country which has about 10 million inhabitants, uh, patients who have difficult to diagnose or difficult to treat disease are usually recommended to our institute. And of course it includes also patients with myositis because you know it's difficult to treat and difficult to diagnose this disease. And over the years we, we've seen many patients and at the moment our cohort counts about more than four, 400 patients with, with myositis. Uh, we did several different uh, research projects. We were happy to collaborate on many uh, projects in projects uh, in Europe and also together with scientists in uh, USA. Uh, we have several ongoing project projects at the moment. Uh, just to mention a few, we we recently finished a, a study in which. Uh, we did a comprehensive evaluation, evaluation of arthritis that is associated with, with myositis. As you know, many patients have arthritis. It sometimes even uh, precedes the manifestations of, of, uh, um, of, uh, muscle, uh, of myositis as muscle weakness. We used the uh, ultrasonography to evaluate the level of arthritis, which uh, may be very severe as comparable to uh, patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. We, we have several fellows working in the lab on, on some aspects uh, of myositis. One aspect is a cytokine called BAF. Uh, this is the cytokine that induces uh, differentiation and stimulation of uh, B lymphocytes that are responsible for production of autoantibodies. As you know, autoantibodies are associated with, with myositis. And this cytokine, we found uh, <coughs> out that uh, it's associated with the activity of the disease, with fluctuation of the activity. So we think it's responsible for some aspects of myositis. So it may be a candidate for the treatment in the future. We also do some clinical trials, participated in several several ones, some of them that Chet Odis didn't mention, uh, but uh, we finished very recently two of them that we organized. One uh, was done organized by us, this was called Prometheus, and uh, this was to evaluate how beneficial it is to add methotrexate uh, to standard prednisone treatment from the very beginning of the disease. And the other one is in collaboration with Ingrid Landberg and Patrick <coughs> Gordon from London, and we evaluated the uh, effect of abatacept. This is the drug used in rheumatoid arthritis or ENSIA. So both studies finished a few weeks ago, so we are now in the process of calculating results, so perhaps next year we will be able to show whether how beneficial these approaches are. Thank you. I guess since we have a time, I'll just ask one question about the, this molecule, the, the BAF protein, um, because I think that's quite interesting, your work on, on BAF and as a potential marker for this, this disease activity in myositis, and obviously becomes more interesting <laughs> since we have a a therapeutic that's on the market that actually interferes with um, BAF that's approved for lupus. So I'm just curious, um, can, can you expand a little bit about, on what, what type, uh, would these be all myositis patients you find with the BAF um, that is dysregulated or are there certain subsets of patients that you think might be more appropriate for trial for this medication that interferes with BAF? Yeah, it's more associated with dermatomyositis than with polymyositis, yeah. So probably, for the treatment, DM would be candidate. Thanks. Hi, my name. I don't know. Try this one. Uh, my name's Andy Mam, and I'm uh, with Lisa Christopher Stein at Johns Hopkins. Um, I trained there as a neurologist and as a neuromuscular fellow. And during my fellowship, I had the opportunity to see um, several patients who had myositis. And um, when I would go to read about them, I realized that there was just very little known 
about what causes myositis. We didn't know, you know, which people are susceptible. Looking at the muscle biopsies, we didn't know how the cells in the in the muscle tissue were actually dying. There were just a lot of unanswered questions. And also there were, in neurology, very few people, really nobody doing work um, on autoimmune muscle disease. So uh, it seemed like a, a good little niche to, um, to go into to try and work. And with Lisa Christopher Stein at the Myositis Center, we've, I've had the opportunity to see a lot of patients. And um, what I'm really interested in is trying to understand exactly how uh, myositis and other autoimmune diseases work. I think um, if you look at diseases like infectious diseases, you know, say a bacterial infection, the reason why we're able to treat them so effectively is we know exactly what the organism is that causes the disease. We know how to grow it in a dish, and because we can do that, we're able to develop medicines to kill the bug. And we're really not at that level of understanding as far as what causes autoimmune disease and myositis. We do have some clues. We know that there are genetic susceptibility factors, that not everyone is equally susceptible to developing the disease. And we also know that there are environmental triggers. And I think this was really driven home to me in clinic when I saw a patient who had absolutely clear-cut florid dermatomyositis, had had it for a couple years, and she had an identical twin sister who did not have the disease. So, you know, it's a real living proof that there are, there must be, um, you know, environmental factors that, that cause it. And Lisa uh, Christopher Stein and I have been working on um, a group of patients who seem to have statin, I would say, triggered um, autoimmune muscle disease. It's maybe 5 to 10 percent of our patients. Um, and we've been able to identify not just the um, environmental trigger, but also we now know that they have a specific genetic susceptibility factor. So about 75% of those patients have one gene um, that's only found in about 5% of the rest of the population. So we're now using this um, uh, group of patients to try to really understand in, in a real detailed way how the autoimmune response um, is triggered in those patients, um, how it's maintained, and how we can uh, treat those patients. We hope and expect that the things that we learn from studying this group of patients are going to be generalizable to other patients with myositis and also patients who have other autoimmune uh, diseases. Okay, thanks, Andy. So, um, just curious about the gene that you mentioned. Um, can that is the gene that you say is present in? allele of about 5% of the normal population. Would you say, therefore, that we should be doing screening for patients who are we're, we're contemplating putting on statins to see if they have this gene? It's, so that's just one, probably, of the factors. So even though, um, you know, five, so 5 to 10% of the people in the general population have this gene, um, and many of them will be put on statins, but only a very small number will actually develop the disease. So we don't know the whole story. There are probably other genetic factors, there may be other environmental factors that, that are important as well. That's a challenge. Okay, so I think um, that's probably look like that'll conclude the, the medical panel portion of the, of the meeting. So hopefully that was uh, enjoyable and somewhat informative uh, for you all. I want to thank you all for, for your interest, for coming, and thanks to the whole panel um, for providing their time. So we'll see you in the breakout sessions. Anything else, Bob? Yeah. We're not let, letting you go that easily. So ha have a seat, Dave. Okay. <laughs> this is our part of the uh, program. Okay, so we have time for questions. We have about 25 minutes. And so if you have uh, a question, put your hand up. There's a microphone circulating. We're going to try getting to as many questions as we can. And uh, okay. Um, wait, hold on. OK. Uh, Dave, if you want to direct the question to the appropriate person, that would be great. OK, my question is, has anyone found a link uh, between statin drugs and IBM. So I'll let either Andy or perhaps 
Lisa take a crack at that? So um, at least in, so the question is, has anybody found a link between um, IBM and the use of statins? Uh, in the population that we look, we have, a, we have a lot of patients with inclusion body myositis, and what I can tell you is that the um, frequency of statin exposure among those patients is really no different than what, we, what you'd expect in the rest of the population. So we don't think that there's an increased risk uh, of developing inclusion body myositis with statins. But we don't know that for sure. We don't know exactly what effects statins have on uh, patients who have muscle disease, but so far, we found no reason to think that statins trigger IBM or that patients who have IBM should not be on a statin. We think they, that these are actually really good drugs and uh, probably unless patients with the inclusion body myositis get put on a statin and clearly get worse or develop some flare that then goes away when the statin is stopped, that would be the only situation in which I would you know, think twice about using a statin. I don't know if anybody else has any other perspective on that. Hello? Uh, I'd echo that. The only thing I would add is that I think just observationally, patients that tend to take statin drugs tend to be a bit older. And of the people in our cohort, if you look across age spectrum, obviously inclusion body myositis encompasses a slightly older, well, it, it does for sure, encompass an older patient population. So my suspicion just looking at the data observationally is that it's true, true, and unrelated, meaning that yes, people with IBM do take statins, but an older patient population tends to be put on them. And as Andy said, we did look specifically at that question and we haven't seen it. Favoritism. I have a question um, that I think a lot of people have about, about drugs and when do you start to go down on the drugs and when not. My blood levels have never been normal, but I keep getting more function. And it's that whole, um, I've tried to go down on steroids three times, I, then I flare, I go back to bed. But what, what do people use for a judgment of when do you start to decrease some of these horrid toxins that we're all pouring into our body? Anyone I want to take a crack at that one? <laughs> I think we all, we all have anyone an opinion. Anyone I want to take a crack at that one? <laughs> yeah, we may need a little more info. Okay, anyone want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, we may need a little more info. Okay, anyone want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, we may need a little more So I guess it's if, you're, like if your blood numbers, my CKs always stay high, my function starts to get better. I'm, I'm working four days a week now. I'm able to do some heart raising exercise, not a lot, because I don't have the greatest lungs. But um, So when do you start to think about taking the you know, right now I'm on rituxan, Celsept, and, and prednisone, and when do you start to think about reducing some of that cocktail? Exactly. So most of your activity has to do with your muscle disease. I mean, largely is what's driving these. Yeah, and as I get more muscle, my fatigue obviously fatigue. gets better, right? And, and so I'm very conscious about getting enough exercise to help the disease that way, getting my sleep and, and food, but I struggle with how much I call my body a toxic wasteland. Right. Lisa. I'll take a stab. So uh, you, I think you bring a, a very good question. It's a question we get clinically a lot. So the first thing you raise is that your CPK, your CK never normalizes. There's, two, there's a corollary to that. The, the, the converse to that is the opposite, where patients come with a completely normal CK because prednisone has dropped it into the normal range and they don't feel any better. So CK often, usually, drops with prednisone and not necessarily, is not necessarily treating everyone. So that's a problem in the reverse. The problem you talk about, and again, I, I say this with only uh, with clinical knowledge and a lot of observational, a lot of observation with no clear data to support it yet. But what I would say to you is this: that yes, there's a subset of patients that never normalize their their numbers. I try as best as possible in my own clinical practice to listen to what you have said and to follow function. So, so we very carefully rate at every single visit a large number of muscle groups and watch the function improve. So it's both my clinical judgment that you're improving, not clinical, you know, uh, observationally in, in, uh, in our clinical exam. Secondly, your functional report of doing better. But the third corollary to that is that what I have found, and I agree with you, I, I, I would also, some of these drugs I prescribe, I would, of course, as a, as a human being, never want to take, and I think they're necessary, I say they're necessary evil. Um, I think that in, it's important that you don't withdraw them too quickly. So I would say this, I agree with what you're saying, I do think that CK by itself cannot be a measure in everyone, 
but that in general, I generally set my patient's expectation that they will be on N immune suppressant, and I don't just use prednisone monotherapy and prednisone alone. I use prednisone in combination with another drug almost from the get-go. I see a skewed patient population of people that tend to be more severely affected. Even those newly diagnosed, I use them both from the beginning, and I generally tell people that a commitment, and again, panelists can certainly disagree. I think there's no, this is an art as well as a science, but in general, one to two years on an immune suppressant. Why? When I've withdrawn them quicker, in my own experience, when patients seem to get better functionally and I withdraw the drug too early, trying to use it again becomes difficult or using any other drug. So for whatever reason, again, it's not best, this is not, in my opinion, based in science, but only on my own observation of a lot of patients, at least one year on an immunosuppressant. And I'll listen to you, and if you tell me you're getting better and my numbers support that, that I see in my own clinical observation you're getting better, withdraw the drug slowly. And I do that in three month increments. So I don't withdraw it completely. You also have a unique situation in that you've taken rituximab, which has in many people a very long lasting effect. In some of my patients, it lasts three months, and many of them it's lasted 18 months to 24 months, and that's rare. But so that also is sort of covering you in the background, so you may be able to withdraw your mycophenolate or Celsept a little earlier in, in, in that regard. So I hope that touches on some of the points you've asked, but I, I just caution you with getting too exuberant and withdrawing too early the, the therapy, because in my experience, it is harder to treat if you, tr if you withdraw it too early. That being said, being on drug for seven years because you have a CPK of 350 is also, I think, inappropriate. Uh, my question's for the lung man. Uh, <laughs> lung doctor, excuse me. Um, a new appellation for Dr. Otis. <laughs> this is great. I, uh, they, the best education was that my PM was triggered by a flu shot. And so I've been forbidden to take flu shots. Now I've had pneumonia six times in my lifetime. Uh, once Legionnaire's disease and once double pneumonia. And now the pneumonia shot is due. And I want to find out, should I take the pneumonia shot? Or will that, I'm in remission. My last prednisone was 15 months ago. So I don't want to trigger it by taking a, so a flu shot. I mean, a, a pneumonia shot. Yeah, well, those are always questions that we get from patients. I, I, you, I, my personal opinion is that you need to take the, the, the flu shot on a on the yearly basis, and of course the Pneumovax. The other the other one is given usually these days and every five years. So I I understand the environmental triggers. You have to I guess take a step back sometimes and say, well the disease has already in some sense established itself, but we do have to avoid or do our best to uh, uh, avoid the uh, complication of infection in a lung that is already compromised. And you know, people that get uh, influenza and they're younger, they handle it better. People who get influenza and they're older and they don't handle it as well. And the other issue here, the, the issue, so the issue here is that you've, got, you've kind of had a hit already to your lung and you want to do everything you can in terms of preventing an infectious, infectious complication that could be more devastating than it would be in you know somebody else sitting at the table with you. So those are complicated questions, but I think I think in, in some sense it becomes easy to to take to use these vaccines. And and there are recommendations that come from the you know our uh, our own specialty society and other specialty societies that have looked at the risk and looked at the benefit. And I I just think my opinion is that you ought to. Uh, to, to move on to the and, and take these vaccines and take these potential preventative measures. A lot of controversy on that, but that's my simple opinion. Yeah, I like to think about triggers as there's two kinds of triggers. There's, if you, if you really are saying that, you know, say vaccines, a lot of patients come and say the vaccine. This started short after, shortly after I had this, a such and such vaccine. There's two triggers for, if you're talking about the autoimmune disease as a fire. One is the match, and the other is the oxygen that you needed to start the, start the fire. Now, if you have a type of trigger, environmental trigger that's like a match, it no longer matters if you put the match out once the fire started. But if it's a trigger like oxygen, it does matter. The more oxygen you give that fire, the more that fire is gonna roar up. And I think we all had experience with environmental medications, things that get reintroduced that were thought to trigger the disease that again flare the disease. Um, and some types of triggers 
um, we think that don't matter anymore probably because the disease is already self-propagating. Um, you know, Mark, I don't know if you have anything more intelligent to say about that, but that's kind of how I think of triggers um, in, this, in that context. We actually have data that we can look at. The Environmental Autoimmunity Group uh, published a paper, Golnera Mamrova, uh, Mamrova uh, published looking at vaccines in diseases, and there was no association with the vaccines causing myositis. So the flu vaccine is very safe, and uh, I would highly recommend that you take it. Look here. I think I've got the microphone. <laughs> um, what is your experience with brain lesions and dermatomyositis? Mine are none, so I'm just looking around. More specific question? Yeah, I mean, maybe is it. Can you expand on that a bit? Um, possibly overlap of lupus. Possibly. So they don't. They haven't definitely said. You're having symptoms, neurologic symptoms, which I, I did, and I had uh, MRIs, and it was proven I have short-term memory loss, but mild, short-term memory loss from lesions. I say, and did the, did the, are your physicians telling you this may be related to your autoimmune disease? Uh, they think maybe it's overlap of lupus. Hmm, which is another very difficult thing to diagnose from, yeah. from a brain scan. But I wondered <laughs> if it was prevalent in DM. Evidently, it's not. It's not. Uh, no, that, I think we can safely say that that is not a prevalent thing we see in DM. So I think you're, you're hearing DMS are wondering about, is there something else going on that may be okay. explaining what, what they're seeing on the scan? Okay. Do, do you know, can I ask you, do you know if you have something called uh, anti-cardiolipin antibodies, or have they worked you up for blood clotting antibodies yet? No, I have not been. I'd, I'd, I'd probably re ask you to see if there is somebody local to you that deals specifically with lupus. So what you describe is not unheard of in lupus. The overlap between lupus and dermatomyositis is rare enough. In that particular situation, I would believe we would have seen it more if it were common. You have mm -hmm. a lot of panelists and we have you know, a, a, over a thousand patients. So I think it's, it behooves you to see a lupus specialist somewhere, either near you or not near you. And if you need any assistance, let me know. All right, thank you. Whoever you want to give the mic to. Uh, is, there a, is it safe to do the shingles vaccine? Is it safe to, do the is it safe to have the shingles, shingles vaccine. vaccine? Okay, good question. Shingles vaccine, anyone want to take on the vaccine issue? We kind of talked about this a little bit. But so the shingles vaccine is a relatively new vaccine. It's a live virus, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we generally avoid live virus vaccines in patients who are taking medicines that suppress the immune system because we can't fight off viruses as well as that. So unless you're off medications, particularly prednisone, um, those kind of things, we, we generally don't give that vaccine. The, the, so, the American so. College of Rheumatology actually has issued uh, guidelines on this. So if you take less than 20 milligrams of prednisone, you or are on methotrexate alone with or without less than 20 milligrams of prednisone, it is deemed to be safe. I can tell you experientially, my patients have gotten the shingles vaccine on that combination with no issue. I am seeing more and more zoster, more shingles on the therapy we use. If there is any chance that you can get vaccinated where it's safe prior to going on therapy, be it prednisone and or another immune suppressant, get the vaccine. The, uh, the waiting time between getting that vaccine and starting drug is debated. If it's possible, again, sometimes you have no choice and it's extreme, and if you wait to be treated, that's worse than, than being vaccinated. If you have a slow onset of your illness or someone you know, I'd advise you to get, and, and it's indicated that you're going to need immune suppression, I'd advise you to get the, get the shingles vaccine and then, um, and then go on at least two weeks, two weeks at a minimum before starting therapy. But methotrexate and, and prednisone, theoretically, and, and other patient populations have been shown to be safe, so I have recommended it to those, those particular patient populations, and I've seen no ill effects so far. So There's one, also one other thing that you should know. For those patients who rituximab is gonna be thought of as a potential treatment, make sure you get your vaccines right away, because once you get uh, rituximab, the efficacy of the vaccine is somewhat diminished. And the other issue is those guidelines about methotrexate and prednisone. 
addressed only methotrexate. And there are other immunosuppressive drugs like Imuran and Celcept that we think are probably safe, but the official guidelines don't address. But if you're on a biologic, no. No, right. And, and, and we each probably have our own biases. I personally think that mycophenolate uh, has, a, has a peculiar hole for herpes family viruses, so I'm a little worried about patients who are taking mycophenolate getting, getting shingles. So. Hi. Um, my daughter, who was diagnosed about a, uh, two years ago, is an identical twin. She's actually a mirror image identical twin, and her identical twin has not been diagnosed. Um, she, they've had different exposures, environmental exposures, over the past few years. Um, my question is, has there been or is there a database or case studies of twins, identical twins with a disease um, in the birth conditions, the womb conditions and the birth conditions? Because they had very different womb conditions. She was a smaller of the twin. She was undernourished during the, uh, while she was in the womb which is not unusual for identical twins, but I was just wondering if there's data, if there's data collection out there in twin studies that, number one, um, she's not here. <laughs> That's why I'm speaking. Um, <laughs> Mom. Um, but if there is um, something for her, you know, to participate in and to look at um, birth studies as well and conditions and birth studies. And then... www clinicaltrials.gov, keyword twin sip. Fred Miller in the Environmental Autoimmunity Group yes. is looking for you. And, <laughs> and we've collected that? over... And your daughter. Over <laughs> <laughs> and the other twin, too? Or just uh, a, we've looked at over problem. 40 twin sip pairs where one has the disease and one doesn't and followed them over that period of time. Several publications are coming out now that are looking at what's going on. And we're finding that genetics has an important role. It's not an absolute role, but the genes and things that are occurring on in the immune system are occurring in the unaffected twin earlier than we thought. So that doesn't mean that the unaffected person is absolutely getting the disease, but it creates a wonderful research protocol that tries to eliminate the effects of, of the environment and look more at a genetic thing, but will ask eight billion questions about the environment in which the, ch the children were raised. So Fred Miller, twin sib study, clinicaltrials.gov, or come up and give me your name and I'll make sure that they get you. Good morning, earlier I heard you speak about you like to collect samples. Um, 1997, I had a biopsy, and it took uh, six weeks to get the pathology report back because they had to send it to three different centers because they didn't know what they were looking at. And it's presently in the basement of the hospital, and I'm fearing it's going to get thrown out. So my question is, would you be interested in anyone in this room getting a hold of their pathology samples and sending them to you guys? I, I, I think that, that, that the studies that we're doing in collecting samples are correlating something about you with your biopsy specimen. So that the answer to that is that it's really, we really encourage you to participate in the different kinds of, of, of studies that peop, the observations are being made uh, on, and, in, and in the context of that, we, most of us would be very interested in seeing your muscle biopsy, but just as an isolated looking at your muscle biopsy, it probably isn't, isn't going to help learn, learn about anything but what's wrong with you at that point. I'm, I've been diagnosed with uh, interstitial lung, and I have uh, polymyositis with overlap of pro possibly uh, scleroderma, and I've just been diagnosed with uh, Sjogren's. My question is, my pulmonologist has just recently put me on a, I've been on six milligrams of prednisone for quite some time and I'm functioning very well that way, but uh, the lung disease seems to be progressing and she just recently put me on uh, my Fortic and it's another, uh, from what I understand, another immune suppressant and I'm wondering if that's uh, a good uh, way to treat this disease or should I have 
maybe something more than that. I, I can. I think the uh, that's a perfectly reasonable approach. There's more and more data coming out on the use of these other <laughs> immunosuppressives, and myfortic is kind of like a sister drug to mycophenolate mofetil called Celsept. So there are different reasons why different individuals are put on those. Uh, one versus the other, but there's a lot of them. I think that that's a very good approach. That what your doctor's trying to do is to lower the dose of prednisone, add another immunosuppressive agent. Myfortic is perfectly reasonable to use, and emerging data is out there that that's a good drug for interstitial lung disease. Okay. Um, uh, one quick comment, uh, Dr. Mailer. It sounds like you could uh, do quite well with a Jane Fonda-like exercise video. Um, <laughs> But um, my question is this, uh, regarding uh, FDA approval versus European Medicines Agency approval, are the regimens used to treat patients in Europe the same, the same therapies as in America, or are, they, are there currently different drugs uh, available in Europe that aren't available here in the United States yet for treatment of these diseases? I'm not aware of um, any differences, and uh, I, I think it depends on the country. For instance, intravenous immunoglobulins that are used relatively frequently in this country, it's very rarely used in our country, but it's the country difference, not the EMA and FDA appro different approach. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, first, thank you all so much for being here this morning. Uh, you all need to know how much we appreciate you and, and the work that you do for us. Um, my question is, is that uh, we've learned a lot about myositis over the last 20 plus years. So as uh, all of you have learned about this, are you seeing a trend of convergence where you're finding more and more commonalities among the different types of myositis? Um, are you seeing commonalities with other diseases like ALS? Or are you seeing uh, divergence where each are becoming more specialized in, uh, as different types of diseases? Along with that, uh, do any of you have an opinion uh, about uh, hereditary IBM being a distinct and separate disease? David, you answer that. Looks like Alan wants to answer that. It's my, it's my opinion that it's very important that um, each patient's specific diagnosis be treated as a specific diagnosis and that, it, that these diseases, especially at the end of your question, the idea that hereditary inclusion body myopathies be considered different from the, the sporadic diseases, but, but it's becoming, I think, more clear to a lot of us that each specific uh, myositis or inflammatory myopathy syndrome has different features, needs to be treated differently, and, and so th that you need to, th th one of the important things in each patient's clinical workup is that they have a precise diagnosis so the doctor can pay attention to the specific concerns and therapies that go along with that specific diagnosis. And I would just take that one step further saying that, I mean, many of us, I mean, the teaching was not so long ago when, for example, that, that polymyositis was dermatomyositis without a rash. And I would say that now uh, we really understand these diseases at the muscle level are really qu quite different. And even I would take your question, your comment a step further and say even within the disease that we call polymyositis, dermatomyositis, there is a substantial amount of patient heterogeneity that actually needs to be dealt with. And um, so your, your, your answer is I think they're becoming more different and even within the diseases we're, we're discovering important differences in patients among those diseases that probably need to be grouped and dealt, sep dealt with separately for many reasons, for research and for, for clinical trials. Excuse me for one moment. I've dealt with this for 16 years. This is my first conference. I only met one other person with DM in July. I can't let you get away without asking you this. I have dermatomyositis with severe calcinosis. I have met one other person, Debbie here, who has the exact same severity that I have. Could we have a subset of uh, another type of myositis that changes the, the paradigm on this entire disorder? Uh, I need some answers. I'm not leaving here without some answers about this. <laughs> it, it, the calcinosis is throughout 
our lower bodies. It's extremely painful. It comes in sheets. It's like granite, and it has a sharp edge like a scalpel. Please help us. Thank you. Tough. Uh, I, I, Jeff, thanks for the question, and I actually understand. I, I, I sympathize because we have many patients that look. The good thing is you have you saying that you met one person. I have many patients like you, and you're right. I think that it. That's another way in which you're saying this is another subset of patients because not everyone with dermatomyositis is getting this problem. And we're finding that, yes, that may relate to some of the autoimmune responses, specific autoimmune responses that are going on um, that others don't have that may put you at greater risk for having the calcinosis. But really what you're asking is also, um, how do we, how, you know, what do we do about it? And, and, and I think the problem is that we don't understand we really don't understand, you know, what is causing the calcinosis? Uh, is it a problem with the tissue? Is it some kind of inflammation that we haven't dealt with that's a peculiar type of inflammation that's leading to calcium deposition in the soft tissues and skin? Um, and unfortunately, there really aren't very many medical therapies. There's things we sometimes try, and, you know, that's a complicated, but there are things we will still try in patients um, to try to deal with the calcium. But I'll say that um, I have a good plastic surgeon, actually, believe it or not, who I work with, who actually um, is very skilled at dealing with removing some of the calcin calcified areas that are causing particular symptoms. And a lot of people will say, well, that'll j they'll just, the calcium will just come back if you take it out. That's a risk, but um, that's not always the case, actually. And I actually find that surgical, if you have the right surgeon that you're dealing with, that actually can be a good adjunct to dealing with some of the, dis the discomfort with the calcium. But we have huge strides we still have to make with understanding why is, are people just depositing all this, you know, this calcium in the tissue. And um, it's something that I'm particularly interested in. There are people working on that. Um, finally, there's, there's interest and in understanding in this, so I, hopefully the future holds better promise for things that we can use to treat the calcinosis. I, I yeah. have a comment. I, I've seen several patients with severe calcinosis, a woman many years ago in the hospital uh, for months and months with a, you know, infection in the thighs, and it was really all the calcinosis in the tissues of her thighs that was, you know, uh, making this inflammation look like it. And the only way we got consulted was the surgeons had done a CT, and they finally saw all these chunks of calcium on the CT. They were looking for an abscess. I have had some luck with the calcinosis improving. I think the surgical techniques when you have large chunks that are already there, we don't have a good treatment to make that go away. The successes that I've seen in preventing further calcium deposits are when the underlying disease is treated effectively. And I, I have seen patients where there has been hesitation by other rheumatologists. Um, there was some rash maybe that was mild, and this progressive calcium, they didn't know what to do with it. In my opinion, uh, having seen patients who the deposits have stopped, it has always been in the setting of control of the underlying disease with immunosuppressive therapy. And so I recently saw another patient with horrible calcium progressing, the edema of the legs, the swelling, and the patient's taking some Plaquenil and fibroprednisone. That's not enough. You know, there are other symptoms that she also has with the disease. So I think you have to attack dermatomyositis and not just focus on the calcium to prevent further calcium, which I think is a manifestation of the disease. We have to figure out why some patients get it and why others don't, but you've got to treat the underlying disease to prevent further calcium depositing. Okay, with that, uh, we have to stop. Uh, I know there's more questions, and we'd like to be able to get everybody's questions, but we want to allow enough time uh, for the next session, which begins in a few minutes. Let me just say before everyone gets up, I want you to understand that the medical advisors are volunteers that are not paid by the Myositis Association. And as you can tell, they are experts in the, in the disease and have really a passion for treating patients and finding a cure. And you heard that a few of them are leaving. We rotate our medical advisors. They can stay on the board for up to six years. Four of them, are rotate, four of them up here right now are rotating off next year. And we elected, uh, or they elected, uh, replacements uh, yesterday at the Medical Advisory Board uh, business meeting. So you're going to see some new faces next year. And I just want to express my gratitude to them. And uh, I'm sure everybody here appreciates the hard work they put in. And they're all working for us. So please give them a round of applause.
Thank you. We will be back here for lunch at 1245.